I think most of the discussions on development of smart cities tends to get focused on technology. Actually, the reality is that major investment is going to go into brick and mortar stuff. For example, new roads, new designs for uh, you know the sewage systems and garbage handling. Uh, I think a better definition for smart city development is to define the end result, uh, and technology is nothing else but an enabler. So while we talk a lot about you know ICT and uh, you know other technologies, smart metering, etc., which is good, which is required, but ultimately they are enablers for creation of smart cities. Um, <clears throat> how do we create a smart city? I think for a greenfield city, it's obviously much easier because you're designing from scratch. But the problem and the challenges will be in the 98 or 100 cities that we are, you know, going to transition. Uh, some of them are, you know, hundreds of years old, so obviously there are inherent problems. Ultimately, the idea is the smart city should be creation of an ecosystem which helps, uh, you know, create an environment which, which allows citizens to pursue economic activity and access to services, including government services, in an efficient and inexpensive manner. So therefore, the issue of technology has to be addressed also in the context of what is the best technology available. Now, depending on which report you read and who's authored that report, they're trying to push a specific technology, obviously, because uh, you know there are inherent uh, interests. But I think the, the specifications that need to be specified and, and prescribed will need to be output-based. So once you have specifications for uh, services and, and technologies uh, which are output-based rather than input-based, it will lead to innovation at the uh, you know, technology developer level. There will be collaborations and therefore collectively they will come up with the most cost-effective uh, methodology. The other issue which needs to be looked at and addressed is uh, financing for these infrastructure projects. Now, obviously, uh, you know, the government cannot finance all of these projects. We're talking about staggering numbers. If you're looking at the 100 smart cities, you're talking about a trillion dollars to be invested over the next 10 odd years. So obviously, the government cannot bring in that capital itself. So you like it or not, there will have to be a very strong private investment component. Now, how does one structure a private investment? Obviously, uh, you know, uh, there will have to be some PPP model that will need to be evolved. Depending on the kind of infrastructure, some of these will be commercially viable and will be amenable to PPP. But there will be certain projects or certain kinds of infrastructure that will not be amenable to PPP. Those are the projects and infrastructures that will need to be built by the government itself. So I think financing and funding for infrastructure uh, for these smart cities is going to come from multiple sources. Uh, obviously, government-funded uh, projects on EPC basis, for example, sewage systems and uh, garbage handling, uh, but the waste to energy, for example, can be done on PPP. Uh, there will be, of course, a large component of you know uh, private capital, which will come in the form of uh, uh, you know PPP uh, investments, and uh, also coupled with some uh, foreign grants or you know uh, you know support from multilateral agencies like the World Bank, uh, the Japanese uh, JBIG, JICA, and similar multilateral organizations. Now, when you look at all of these uh, together. Uh, I think the challenges are obviously daunting and therefore what is required is a certain level of standardization because while uh, you know it's, it's clear that we cannot experiment with the 100 cities so there needs to be a certain amount of uniformity and predictability in terms of the kinds of commercial and financial structures that we adopt. So uh, some of this can be enforced through the grants that are given by the government for the city so they can be coupled with certain specific deliverables and frameworks that they need to be adopted, uh, specifically in the context of uh, awarding projects in PPP basis. Uh, there should be some model documents, model concession agreements that should be created, and uh, that can be done uh, by the central government or some, some body at the center, for example, the Niti Aayog, and uh, use that as model documentation, which is coupled as a, as a condition to the grants being uh, given to these cities. Ultimately, also, it's important to understand that these cities cannot be cloned. Each city has its own dynamics, its own uh, ecosystem, its own uh, you know, economic drivers. So an Ajmer, for example, cannot be equated with a Vijayawada. So uh, ultimately, the commercial model for each of the cities will have to be developed. Now, uh, finally, uh, the final point that I have is that current, in the current legal structure and the constitutional framework that we have, every city will need to have, it already has, a municipality of its own. So the question that will arise is how does one take away the responsibilities or how does one empower the municipalities because ultimately you will need one strong nodal agency with appropriate uh, capacity 
uh, that will be able to design, plan and execute the infrastructure projects in the uh, smart cities. And because, you know, these need to be coupled with the whole, uh, I would say, creation of environment where uh, citizens are also encouraged to pay user charges. Ultimately, somebody has to pay for this. And uh, the only people who ought to pay for this are the consumers. And therefore, you need to create the infrastructure and services in a manner that is affordable, efficient, and it incentivizes the citizen.